So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Nabil Iqbal from Department of Mathematical Science, Durham University. And um, it's, uh, he, he's going to present his lecture or talk on higher form of symmetries from the 3D Ising model with the weakly coupled string theory dual. And uh, uh, this is basically 63rd QSTM Zuminar. And uh, we are very thankful to Nabil for having here. And um, so uh, you can start Nabil from your end and uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you. And we are welcoming you from India or like what to say from every part of the world. <laughs> okay, so you can start. Okay, fantastic. Um, so let me begin uh, by thanking Anton for giving me the chance to give this talk. Uh, I think this is a great initiative that you're running and I'm really happy to be a part of it. Okay, so, um, so let me get started. The title of my talk, Higher Form Symmetries from the 3D Ising Model to String Theories. And this is something I did in collaboration with John McGreevy. Um, a lot of it is in this paper that came out last March, uh, a million years ago. And a lot of it is also in some work that will appear hopefully sometime soon within the next few weeks, but I'm, I'm not quite sure how long it'll take. I want to sort of just emphasize again what, what Charenton said. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I've given several Zoom seminars by now, but it, it's, it's much more fun for me at least if people ask questions, interrupt and ask questions if anything is not at all clear, or if you want to make a point. Okay, let's get started. Oops. Okay, this talk basically has three parts. The first part is going to be some motivation. And in that motivation part, I'm going to discuss, I'm going to try to explain the idea of higher form symmetries. Higher form symmetries are a kind of new theory that are, I think, extremely useful for all kinds of things. And I'm going to try to convince you of that in the motivation part. In the next part, I'm going to discuss the 3D Ising model. I'm going to discuss some attempts that we made at trying to solve it using string theory. And uh, this is great fun. I'll tell you about it. It, um, this is the material that's mostly in this paper from, uh, from last March. It's a lot of fun, but it doesn't quite work. And then in the very last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss something called mean string field theory, which is a much more um, uh, less well-developed attempt to, to understand the, the same sorts of physics, but this is still work in progress. And uh, I hope there's something for everyone. The first part is just motivation. The second part is really going to be statistical physics. It's going to be some really correct detailed stuff on the lattice. And the last part is a kind of a lot more, um, it's a lot more fluffy, it's a lot more hand wavy, but hopefully uh, people will still find it of interest. Okay, so let's get started. First, some motivation. So I wanna begin in a very basic, very general way. The basic uh, framework behind our understanding of the phases of matter is the idea of global symmetries, okay? When matter comes in many different, in many different phases, and the way in which we classify them, the way in which we understand them has everything to do with so-called global symmetries. Let me remind everyone what exactly a global symmetry is. Instead of the simple example, let's imagine taking, for example, an Ising spin system on a uh, two-dimensional lattice, okay? I think everyone knows about the Ising model, the 2D Ising model, but let me just remind you, I have a bunch of spins that are arranged on a lattice, on a two-dimensional lattice like this, and, um, and let me just confirm, you can see my cursor, is that correct? Um, I am going to assume that you can, okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, okay, great. Okay, so, um, so I have here a two-dimensional lattice and at each point on the lattice, I have a spin. The spin can be either up or down. I call these spins sigma i, and so sigma i is plus or minus one. Plus one means up, minus one means down, okay? The Hamiltonian of the 2D Ising model is the following. You sum over all the links on the lattice. This angle bracket ij means that you sum over the link between the sites i and j. And the Hamiltonian is just this, it's minus j times this, this product of spins, okay? Now, what does this mean? Well, you see, that means that if you have two spins that disagree, then because they disagree, they will give you a minus sign when you multiply them together and therefore you will get a plus contribution to the Hamiltonian, okay? This, so this Hamiltonian called the two spins are different. What is okay. the here? 
Sorry, what is what is J? Yes. Uh, J is just a constant. You can think of it as the uh, the inverse temperature. Okay. okay, it's just a constant. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Good. So, um, so this is the Hamiltonian of the 2D Ising model. And I'm sure most of you have seen this in some statistical physics class at some point in your life. Okay. So now this model obviously has a global symmetry. The global symmetry just takes every spin and flips it. Okay. The Hamiltonian is clearly invariant under that symmetry. Let me now discuss um, the physics of this model. Okay. So remember, it costs energy whenever two neighboring spins are different. So if you now stick this into a, into a statistical mechanics thing and, and ask what's happening at finite temperature, the model has two phases, okay? Let me first discuss the low temperature phase. At low temperatures, what's happening is that the system wants to minimize its energy. The way to minimize its energy is to have every single spin lined up because then all the spins agree and there's no energy cost, okay? This is the so-called ordered phase, okay? This model is often used to describe magnetism. In the magnetic language, this is called the ferromagnetic phase. And in this phase, the symmetry is spontaneously broken, okay? There's long range order in the system. When I say it's spontaneously broken, I just mean that all the spins are pointing up, okay? They're not pointing down. So clearly the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And when I say this long range order, imagine taking the spin spin correlator, okay? Now, as you separate the two spins in the spin spin correlator by some large distance, so imagine I'm asking if this spin is correlated with this spin, at long distances, this thing will factorize into a product of two individual spin operators. And because there's a net spin, a net magnetization, these things will be non-zero, okay? And so the long range correlation function is not zero. What that means physically is that the spin here is very correlated with the spin there. There's long range order in the system, okay? So this is one of the phases of the model. Now imagine I take the temperature and I start to crank up the temperature. At some point, you see that the temperature makes things want to wiggle, right? Temperature creates disorder in the system. And at some point, the spins will start to flip up and down. If you heat it up high enough, it turns out there is a phase transition to a so-called disordered phase. So here's a snapshot of the disordered phase. You can see, you know, you can't tell whether the spins are mostly up or mostly down. Some of them are up, some of them are down. And in fact, that means the symmetry is unbroken, okay? And now if you ask the same question about the correlator of two different spins, then what's going to happen is that correlator will decay exponentially as you separate these two spins by a distance, okay? And so the symmetry here is it decays exponentially in space. So the idea here is that you use the realization of the symmetry, whether the symmetry is broken or unbroken, to distinguish the two phases. So okay. uh, now, have any questions about in, yeah. uh, Yes. In, since you are talking about two different phases, at which point this phase yeah. transition happened? Very good. What There's a specific the value color? of J at which the phase transition happens. Yeah. So, if you recall here, if you that I stick this into a statistical mechanical model, I do e temperature. There's a specific value of J at which the transition happens. I don't remember the value, but you can look it up. It's um, it, it's it's a precisely known value. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So excellent question. Uh, so in the next slide, that the parameter aim. Are you calling this aim to be the order parameter of this phase transition or something like that? Yes, exactly. The sigma is the order parameter of the transition. Here, oh, M, sorry. M is not the order parameter. M is the correlation length, okay? okay. okay. And the correlation length depends on J in a specific fashion that you can work out explicitly for the 2D Ising model. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Um, any other questions from anyone? So in the first slide, uh, you mentioned that they are neighboring sides, right? Yeah. yeah but uh, in the second slide, uh, you are talking correlation between, and uh, they are not the neighbors, or? No, I'm talking about general correlations. In fact, these twiddles are correct at large separation. Okay, so yeah. very, very far apart from each other. So, so not, not neighboring, quite far. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, the neighboring sites don't really have much information. The, the neighboring spin-spin correlator is just, it's just always gonna be some number. Excellent. Okay, 
So, um, okay, so this is describing, you know, phase transitions. So now let me now point out that between these two phases, there's a phase transition where you go from the, the disorder to the spontaneously broken phase, okay? The, the unbroken to the spontaneously broken phase. Let me now talk about that phase transition a little bit. So close to the phase transition, it actually makes sense to introduce a coarse grain field for the order parameter. What do I mean by this? I'm gonna call this field phi. And the idea behind phi is you take a bunch of spins and you sort of average over them in some way. Okay, like just, you know, take the average of like four spins or eight spins or 20 spins, some large number of spins, average them to get a coarse grain field, which I'm gonna call phi. Okay. Now this phi field will inherit the Z2 symmetry from the spins, okay? The Z2 symmetry is realized on this field phi as a spin, as a, as a sign change on the field phi, okay? And now the point is, you see, as you approach the phase transition point, longer and longer scales, and it turns out that the long wavelength fluctuations can be described by a continuum field theory, okay? So how do you figure out what this field theory is? What you do is, you start to write down a continuum field theory and you write down every term that is allowed by the symmetries. So for example, you can have a graph term, you can have an M square phi squared term, you can have a lambda phi to the fourth term, blah, blah, blah. You can have a phi cube term because that's not allowed, okay? And then it turns out that at the critical point, okay, so now, now you have this, this, this field theory. Now this field theory has two different phases, right? If there is positive, this potential has a unique minimum, phi will roll down to the bottom of that minimum and sit there, and the VEV of phi equals to zero. In this phase, the symmetry is unbroken. Or you can have M square be negative. If M square is negative, then you have this sort of double well potential. And here phi rolls down to the bottom of the double well potential, and now the VEV of phi is not equal to zero, okay? So in this phase, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. In this phase, the symmetry is unbroken. At the critical point, m squared equals to zero, right between the two transitions, we have a conformal field theory that describes the phase transition. And in the case of the Ising model that I discussed earlier, that conformal field theory is just the normal 2D Ising CFT, which some of you might have studied, okay? So the point here is that you can study phase transitions with a continuum field theory. This continuum field theory describes long wavelength stuff and doesn't know about the details of the microscopic theory. Okay, so now these ideas that I just told you describe what's called the Landau paradigm, okay, of the classification of phases of matter. The idea is phases of matter are classified by their patterns of broken and unbroken symmetries, and critical points between phases can be studied by universal theories, like this one, of the order parameter field. This idea works spectacularly well for many phases of matter, and it's sort of the foundation of textbook condensed matter physics. And here's a picture of Landau who basically introduced this to us. Now, it works for many things, but not everything. Before telling you where it doesn't work, I've already got this picture before. Okay. So it works really well for many phases of matter, but not for everything. And a lot of modern work in condensed matter theory involves phases and transitions between them that do not fit into this paradigm. For example, you can have something called topological order. Um, if you Google topological order then, and Google images, then this picture of this pretzel comes up. I think it's because the, the, um, the, the things in the pretzel are winding around each other. But in this talk, whenever you see a pretzel, it means topological order. And um, topological order is some sort of interesting long range uh, order phenomenon that describes, for example, deconfined phases of lattice gauge theory, exhibit topological order. Exhibit topological order. And the interesting thing is topological order does not fit into the standard Landau paradigm. We cannot describe it with the ideas of symmetry and broken unbroken symmetry. And um, there are many other ideas, for example, deconfined quantum criticality, non-fermi liquids and so on and so on. There are many interesting phases that don't fit into that paradigm. You can ask me about that afterwards if you're interested and I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it. But the main point is there are things that don't fit into the standard Landau paradigm of broken and unbroken symmetries. So now you should ask, can we, better, can we come up with a better framework to describe these phases of matter? And uh, I think that we can, okay? To explain how to do this, I have to introduce the idea of um, higher form symmetries. 
And to do that, I'm going to begin by reminding you how normal global symmetries work. So let's take a step back from the stuff I was talking about and just talk about ordinary global symmetries for a bit. So ordinary global symmetries um, are things that involve the conservation of particle number. Okay. So for example, let's imagine a U1 symmetry. Okay. So imagine your favorite quantum field theory with a U1 global symmetry. And um, this symmetry means that you have a conserved current, uh, d mu j mu equals to zero. Now, what does this mean? This conserved current counts a number of particles which is conserved, right? So how does this work? If you think about this, what's happening is if you want to count a number of particles, what you do is you integrate over a time slice, okay? And you integrate jt over a time slice. And if you do that, you count a certain number of particles. In form language, which that is, that you take star j, okay? And integrate that over a co-dimension one manifold, which is a time slice. Now, when you get that, that conserved charge, the charge is conserved, which means that you can evaluate this conserved charge at later times or earlier times, and you get the same number. Okay. And that's what it means for particle number to be conserved. It means that there is a charge operator defined on a co-dimension one manifold, in other words, a time slice, which is topological. You can move it upwards in time or downwards in time, and the answer doesn't change. And thus the particle number is conserved. Okay. And if you want to see that in formulas, you should just imagine this formula here says that d star j equals to zero. If you integrate star j on a co-dimension one manifold, you can deform that manifold and you always get the same answer. Okay. And this is what it means for particle number conserved. However, the point is, if you think about what topological order involves, topological order seems to involve not conserving particles, but rather higher dimensional objects. You often have things like strings or flux tubes or things like that in your theory, and those guys are conserved. So now a very natural question is, is there a symmetry principle that enforces the conservation of higher dimensional objects? And in fact, there is. This symmetry principle is called higher form symmetries. And I first learned about them from this paper by Gaioto, Kapustin, Cyber, and in about 2014. And so they're a relatively new theoretical idea. And what they do is they enforce the conservation of higher dimensional objects, for example, strings. So in a higher form symmetry, what you have is you have a current j mu nu, which is not a one index object, but a two dimensionally symmetric object. Okay? J is a two form and this thing is conserved. All right, so d mu j mu nu equals to zero. You should imagine this extra index here, nu, describes uh, the direction that the string is pointing in. Okay, that's what this extra nu index has to do with. And so now the idea is this thing is conserved Let's think about how to count strings. You have a bundle of strings, a bunch of strings that are poking through your computer screen, and you want to count all of them. How do you do that? Well, you don't have to integrate over the whole room, right? The strings don't end. The strings have no endpoints. And so if they poke through your computer screen, you can just integrate over your computer screen and count one every time one of these strings pokes through your screen. And now you can move that integration surface towards space or upwards in time, and you always get the same answer. And so the string number is conserved, but you do the integral now over a co-dimension two surface, not a co-dimension one surface. And so the charge operator defines a co-dimension two manifold, and it is some, it, it's topological. You can move it towards you in space or upwards in time, and you always get the same answer. So this defines a conserved string number. And if you have a U1 symmetry, then it's really a conserved string number. And if you have a ZK symmetry, then the string number is conserved modulo K, okay? So if you have a Z2 symmetry, then one string is conserved, but two strings violate, kill each other. So this is a, a very simple theoretical idea, and this is a normal global tree, okay? And finally, something that's a bit surprising is this exists in many very ordinary systems. For example, 4D electrodynamics, with the first field theory that I'll study in elementary, in undergraduate, um, has well, these symmetries. It has a symmetry for uh, the conservation of magnetic lines and the conservation of electric flux lines, which you can think of as strings that are conserved in the following way. And these symmetries do everything that normal symmetries do. For example, they have goldstone modes if you spontaneously break them. They can have anomalies. 
you can do hydrodynamics with them. I've had a surprising amount of fun doing hydrodynamics with these uh, higher form symmetries and so on and so forth. Okay. So are there any questions about this idea before I proceed? So here you have written for uh, two spin objects <laughs> like yeah. uh, mu and mu. So is this yeah. kind of generalized for any arbitrary spin? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, you can generalize it to any number of indices here. So okay. you want to have a, um, you can have a P form mm -hmm. and uh, basically um, you call this a, if the number of indices here is P, you call it a P minus one form symmetry. Yes. Okay. But the idea works fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, excellent. Hi, hello. For the case of electromagnetism, so as you describe it, kind of just recovers what we already know from Maxwell equations. Yep. So does it give any more insights that you know of, for example? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. I think it does. So um, you know, I found the most... So well, here are some questions you might have. You might have lain away at night wondering, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you might have been been bothered, why is the photon massless? Okay, the 4D photon. Mm -hmm. So when we learn, when I teach quantum field theory, I tell my students, it's massless because of gauge symmetry. But you see, this is a lie, right? <laughs> you see, you can have a superconductor or you can hate the, the photon and it's still gauge invariant. It's just not massless anymore. Mm -hmm. so, you know, what did I really mean? Why, why is the photon massless? I claim the photon is massless because it's a Goldstone mode of, of a spontaneously broken symmetry, which is this guy, okay? So that's kind of you know philosophical insight, and got a lot of practical stuff out of doing the hydrodynamics from this because basically there's this field called magnetohydrodynamics, which is sort of complicated, but you can organize it variously by thinking of the hydrodynamics of this this higher form current. I think that's a useful way to organize this. You can actually get some quantitative information like um, transport coefficients and things like. That. So you know it's it's a it's a well studied system, but I think you should always start by understanding the global symmetries. And then maybe once you learn new things, maybe it doesn't, but at least it's of some philosophical importance, maybe. But um, yeah, it's an excellent question. Okay, thank you very much. Good. Um, any other questions? Um, okay, so um, let me now um, just present a slide sort of uh, comparing higher form and normal symmetries, okay? So here are some basic facts about normal symmetries. If you have a normal symmetry, then you might ask, what is a charged object? Well, you know, operators are charged under symmetries, right? For example, if I have a U1 symmetry, I rotate this operator by a phase and operators defined on space at points. They're local operators defined at points, okay? Now, um, again, there are two different phases. There's a spontaneously broken phase where the two-point function of the charged operator factorizes into two one-point functions. These guys have a non-zero VEV in the spontaneously broken phase. And there's an unbroken phase where the two-point function of the charged operator eventually decays away exponentially with some mass gap, okay? Now, all of this works for higher form symmetries as well, differently. Higher form symmetries, the charged objects are not um, point-like line operators instead. And the reason why is that higher form symmetries count strings. If you want to make a string, then you have to act with a line operator that tells you what the string is doing at one instant in time. So you've acted this line operator and the string goes off and does its thing. So the things that are charged under higher form symmetries are line operators. In many theories, it turns out Wilson lines and Toft lines are charged form symmetries. What is the log of the spontaneous phase? What happens is this line operator obeys a perimeter law. In other words, it depends only locally on the length of this curve, okay? If you think about it, it's kind of like right? Because it depends only on what's happening at the point where you apply the line operator, okay? So the analog of a spontaneously broken phase is a perimeter law for the line operator. The analog of the unbroken phase is an area law, okay? And again, if you think about it, this makes sense. The area is something which fills in this, this surface here. And um, it's kind of like in case you see you have two operator insertions and the distance between them is kind of like this zero dimensional. Curve. Okay. So the main point here is that there are two different phases which are classified by the long distance behavior of the charged objects, which can ca characterize what phase you're in. Okay. Now, many of you will know about confinement. 
it turns out confinement of quarks is a very specific example of this symmetry. And it was to describe such things that Gaiolo, Kapustin, Saberg, and Willett first invented this formalism. Okay. okay. But the basic idea is everything sort of uh, carries over just with more dimensions attached. Okay. So now it is really tempting to try to describe a Landau paradigm. So here's a new Landau paradigm. The new Landau paradigm is that phases of matter are classified by their patterns of broken and unbroken symmetries, which might be higher form symmetries. And the second point would be critical points between phases can then be studied by universal theories of the order parameter, which in this case has something to do with these strings. Okay. So let's turn this a little bit. Point number one turns out to work for many examples of topological order. Topological phases, in fact, are exactly those that have spontaneously broken discrete higher form symmetries. But what about point number two? Point number two suggests that there should be certain phase transitions which could be described by the condensation of strings in some sense, okay? So this is a very confusing concept. Let's push on this a little bit. The simplest example you think of turns out to be pure Z2 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions. It turns out that this Z2 gauge theory, um, the details of which are not important for us, turns out to spontaneously break a Z2 higher form symmetry in its deconfined phase. But people have studied this transition a lot. They have shown that the transition between trivial and topological phases is in the 3D Ising universality class, okay? And so if you believe all the stuff I'm telling you, what that really suggests is the 3D Ising model should be described by the condensation of strings, whatever that means. And so next um, 20 minutes or so, or 30 minutes, I'm going to describe to you, or remind you what the 3D Ising model, I'm gonna tell you how we're going to try to solve it using string theory. Okay, that's going to be the next part of this talk. Okay, I'll go on to the, the next part of the talk. Okay. Okay, now, now let's talk about 3D Ising. Sorry. Yeah. So, can you please comment more, uh, a little bit more about this condensation of the strings? <clears throat> yeah. Good, so um, I, I will do so in, in the rest of the talk, but let me just say a few fluffy words at this point, okay? Mm -hmm. So basically, the way to think something like that, you see, in this normal, we're all more comfortable with, what's happening in the ordered phase is that phi is condensing, right? We often think of this as the condensation of particles, right? Yes. Because phi is an operator in a quantum field theory that creates particles, and when phi sinks down over here, we see the particles condensed, right? Yes. Okay. Now, in this new symmetry principle, what's happening is we have strings and not particles, okay? Mm -hmm. And what happens is it is this line operator that develops a VEV, okay? Mm -hmm. Previously, phi developed a VEV, and now this line operator develops a VEV. So what does that mean? Well, you might so think this that this has something with the condensation of strings. So this line operator you are writing for any arbitrary spins. Yes, this line operator is some sort of line operator defined on a curve C, okay? Yeah. And you should imagine it makes a string, mm -hmm. okay? You act with it and it creates a string. So if this line operator condenses, then that sort of means that strings have condensed in some sense, okay? okay. There's some jumble of strings fluffing around in the vacuum. That's why the line operator has a non-zero value. In this phase, it's very different, okay? In this phase, the strings are not condensed. You have an area law instead for the strings. In this phase, the strings are condensed. Okay. Now, the truth is, these are just words. I'm just giving you words to wrap around this math. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, that's, so these are just words that I find helpful. The math is really these two things. There are two different phases of the line operator. And yes. I want to call this, this line operator the condensation of strings. Okay. So for this one spin, uh, yes. we, uh, we like this as path integral of, not path integral, means like, integral over the contour C, mu dx mu? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, that's right. Integral, e to the i, integral C thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Some gauge field often. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Exactly, exactly. Okay, good. Uh, any other questions? Um... Uh, Nabil? Yeah, please. Yeah, so can you go to the slide where you showed the spontaneous breaking of symmetry? 
uh, if you don't mind uh, uh, no uh, the earlier one you showed the hamiltonian okay. and you were describing oh yeah, yeah, yeah. this one okay. uh yeah so uh, i don't understand what you mean here by spon uh, symmetry spontaneously broken isn't the hamiltonian still symmetric oh that's right that's right so uh, the hamiltonian is definitely symmetric however the symmetry can be spontaneously broken meaning exactly this okay the ground state of the hamiltonian breaks the symmetry even though the hamiltonian is symmetric oh okay Okay, that, that's what I mean by this. And to be honest, you can take this as a definition, this thing right here, uh, of spontaneous symmetry. The non-trivial fact is this is possible even though the Hamiltonian is symmetric, okay? And here's the fact that this happens. We have, and it's, you know, you can go to your fridge and it sticks on the, sticks on the fridge because this is happening, okay, basically. So you mean, uh, no, I, I don't see, uh, sorry, I, I don't see what is uh, symmetry breaking about this. Can you point out which? Oh, um, basically, because all the spin, the, the, this state is basically sigma equals to plus one, right? right. That's what this state looks like. However, mm. the symmetry is sigma goes flips the sigma, right? So right. sigma equals plus one is different. Spins are pointing. Oh, okay. Out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this ground state breaks the symmetry spontaneously. That, that's all that I mean. Yeah. So notice that okay. that happens even though Hamiltonian is, is, is symmetric. Okay. 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 Yeah. Makes sense? Okay. Excellent. Any other questions uh, for moving on? Yeah. So again, I've prepared it relatively leisurely talks. So there's plenty of time for everyone to ask questions. I'd love to remember. Okay. Very good. So um, now, okay. So now let me move on. So basically, I should have mentioned something a bit earlier that the, this thing I discussed in the 2D Ising model, which is very well studied. The 3D Ising model is much harder. I'm going to talk about that now. Okay. okay. So now on to the 3D Ising model and string theory. So the 3D Ising model is the same idea as the 2D Ising model, except in three dimensions. However, unlike the 2D Ising model, the 3D Ising model is unsolved. Okay. It is a strongly coupled difficult physics problem that remains unsolved. And in fact, many people have tried to solve this using string theory. I believe one of the reasons Polyakov invented string theory was to try to make some, some progress on this problem. So let me now um, explain to you uh, why string theory has a model. So let's begin by taking the 3D Ising model on a cubic lattice, okay? So previously I had a, a square lattice, now I have a cubic lattice. So here's a picture of a cubic lattice. In this picture, the way I'm going to illustrate things is that there are many points on the cubic lattice. And um, the, again, the points on the lattice have spins, which can go up or down. And I'm going them by saying, up. I'm going to put a red sphere there. And if the spin is down, I'm going to keep it empty. Okay. So for example, here's a clear on anything. That's what's happening in this picture. The Hamiltonian is the same as before you sum over all the links on this lattice and you multiply together i times sigma j across each of the links, okay? So for example, here's a link, I multiply this spin times this spin, here's a link, I multiply this spin times this spin and so on and so forth. Now, what is this actually doing? Notice that there's an interesting way to visualize this of spins. Let me imagine that whenever two neighboring spins disagree, let me, define this as saying there's an occupied domain wall that separates the two spins, okay? So uh, what do I mean by that? So for example, here's a spin which is up and here which is down. These two spins disagree. And so I'm gonna say there's a domain wall living on the dual lattice between the two of the spins, okay? However, these two spins agree. So there is no domain wall separating those two, okay? So given any configuration of spins on the 3D lattice of up and down spins, you can figure out a configuration of domain walls where the idea is that the domain separate up spins from. Okay. Now, the Heising Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian simply counts the area of all of these domain walls. Okay. Because whenever these two spins disagree, you get a number from that. You get a plus one whenever they disagree. And then you add that up across all the links on the lattice. 
And therefore, this Hamiltonian just measures the area of all of the, these domain walls. Okay. Okay. So this is what the 3D Ising model is doing. It's measuring the area of the domain walls separating up and down spins. So is this a string theory? So you know, uh, we've studied string theory, and we know that in string theory, we have the Nambu Goto action. And the Nambu Goto action is also measuring the area of two-dimensional string word sheets. So let me just imagine that each of these domain walls is like a string sheet. In that case, the Ising Hamiltonian is a lot like the Nambu Goto action. And you can imagine that when you sum over all the spins, you're summing over all the different spin configurations. And it's a lot like the string theory. Now, there is, however, one problem. The problem is that when we do string theory, normally there is a suppression of the genus, right? There's a string coupling. In other words, the action in string theory is not just the Nambogoto action, it's also this topological term that depends on the string coupling. And the string coupling, we only take that to be small, and that suppresses the higher genus, uh, Riemann, higher genus string world sheet. This action here does not have any dependence on the genus. And so therefore, this is a lot like a strongly coupled string theory, okay? Where GS equals to one, all right? There's some details here about the sign of the string coupling that I'm not gonna tell you about. But GS in this string theory equals to one. In other words, the 3D Ising model is like a string theory that is very, very strongly coupled. It turns out this and other reasons are, are why the problem of solving the 3D Ising model using string theory is actually a very hard thing to do. And so in the rest of the talk, I'm going to describe how to improve the usual 3D Ising model. In particular, I'm going to add a new coupling to the Ising model, which will give it a tunable string. Okay. GS is going to be a new parameter in my 3D Ising model. And then I'll be able to suppress the higher genus world sheets by tuning the value of GS. Okay. So in particular, if I take GS very small, then only the spherical world sheets will contribute and all the higher genus ones will not. Okay. Okay. Any other philosophy before I move on? Okay. So Nabil, this is the proposal. Uh, yeah. So this is the proposal. What chi corresponds to here, then the genus. Uh, chi is the Euler character of the surface. The Euler characteristics, yes. Yeah, so it's 2 minus 2g. Two yes, 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 yes. Excellent. Good. Good. So this is the proposal. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Turns out I will succeed in doing this. I will not succeed in solving the Ising model, unfortunately. But <laughs> baby steps. Okay. Good. Um, other questions, anyone? Okay. Okay. So now, how do we do this? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Hamiltonian and I'm going to modify it. In particular, I want to find a local way to measure the Euler character of all the domain walls that make up a given spin configuration. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, it turns out we can do that because the Euler character is equal to the number of faces minus the number of edges plus the number of vertices in a, um, of a given configuration. So it turns out to define the so-called wall operator. Um, and the wall operator is defined on a face of the dual lattice or a link of the original lattice. The way you define this is you take one minus sigma i times sigma j. So you take the product of the two sigmas across the link and you do one minus sigma i sigma j. And that gives you the so-called wall operator. So this thing returns one if you have a domain wall there and returns zero if you don't. So using this wall operator, it's very easy to count the number of faces. What you do is you sum over all the plaquettes in the dual lattice and you act with the wall operator. If you have a domain wall there, then you get one. And if you don't, you don't. So then we can count the number of faces in this configuration quite easily by just taking this sum. Okay. Okay, so we're done with faces and then we have to do edges and vertices. So counting edges turns out to be slightly harder. What you have to do is, each possible edge configuration, different walls is taking part. Okay. So, for example, here are some things that can happen. All right. You can have no domain walls at all, in which case you have zero. 
In each of these configurations, you have one domain wall taking part on that ladder on that edge. And this configuration is clear. You have two different domain walls that are participating at this link, right? I should count this as two and count each of these as one. So how do I do that? Write down a projector onto each configuration. For example, you call this projector W1, W2, 1 minus W4, or 1 minus W3. And um, that's a projector which gives you a 1 if it's acting on this configuration and a 0 on every other configuration. And then you sum this over all possible configurations, multiplying it by this number d sub e. Okay. So you sum over these eight configurations, multiply by this number, times the projector onto each configuration. And this is now an operator, which if you sum over all the edges on the lattice, will correctly count the number of edges in this, uh, in this configuration. Okay. okay, so we're making good progress. We're done with the number of faces and the number of edges. Now we have to figure out the number of vertices. It turns out the vertices are significant because over here, I only had eight different configurations. It turns out I have 128 different possibilities at each vertex. And now I have to do, what I have to do is, I have to do what I did for edges and figure out how many different domain walls does each vertex put in. So the way to do this is you take a configuration like this one and you try to see how to pull it apart into simpler configurations. The number of disjoint simpler configurations is the number that I want here, okay? So for example, you can take this and pull it apart in this way. You get here two because you can pull this apart into two different surfaces. Now, you know, there's a conceptual issue because some vertex configurations can be decomposed into primitives in multiple ways. For example, this guy can be pulled apart into this configuration where I have two different domain walls or this one where I have three. And so now there's genuinely a problem, which of these two do I pick? Okay, I have to make a choice about this. So it turns out there are two different options and we studied both of them in the paper. The first one is a so-called note two is you say, I don't want to think about this. This is hard. So you add in your Hamiltonian an energetic penalty that forbids these configurations. Okay. It's not like saying these string world sheets now repel each other in a specific fashion. Okay. And uh, this is easy to think about, but um, the downside is that you no longer have the usual Ising model. And we're going to do a simulation in a little bit. It's harder to simulate these because um, uh, for technical reasons involving the Monte Carlo simulator. The other choice is the following. The choice is that you decompose this into as many primitives as possible while preserving rotational invariance. So in this case, I could have broken it apart into two surfaces or three surfaces. I'm going to choose the one where I break it apart into three surfaces because three is bigger than two. Okay. So we studied both of these ideas. I'm going to mostly discuss this one in this talk. Okay. And um, if you're interested, you can take a look at the paper for the other protocol. So we've done that, we can just basically tabulate all the different possibilities, all 128 of them, and write a projector onto each one. And so then after doing all of that, we get an operator for our Hamiltonian. It's a complicated operator, but it counts the number of vertices that is present in this spin configuration. Okay. It's still local, it's just a little bit complicated to write that. However, it turns out that we're not actually done yet because what we're doing is we're making a choice about how to reconnect the walls at each vertex. And what might happen is that we might make a choice where we pull apart these walls in a way that is incompatible across an edge. So for example, here is one vertex and here is one vertex. Imagine that this red line here means that I'm pulling these things apart so that this is one surface, but on the other side, it is this that is one surface, okay? There's some sort of topological confusion happening at this point. All right. It turns out this introduces a four pi branch point curvature singularity at this point. And you can take this into account by writing a more complicated edge projector. Okay. So this is just to, to illustrate that this is a complicated thing that you can think about. I don't want to go into too much more detail about this because it's actually rather complicated. I just want to say that it, it's possible this didn't make much sense, what I just said here. He actually understood it was by making paper models. So Here's a brief interlude. It turns out that if this was very confusing, you can see what we did by making your own branch point singularity. Uh, the idea is take a screenshot of the screen right now. I'll give you a second. 
Okay, and then print it out and follow these instructions. If you do it correctly, you get something that looks like this. And there's a curvature singularity between these two things. And you can move around this curvature singularity and count and verify for yourself that the curvature singularity is indeed four pi along there. Okay. Okay. So um, that was quite a lot of information, but let me just conclude. At the end of the day, we can write down a Hamiltonian for the 3D Ising string theory. This Hamiltonian has two parameters in it. It has the ordinary part that just counts the number of faces. And it has a new part that counts the number of faces minus the edges plus the number of vertices. And I'm going to multiply that with a coupling called the dilaton. So this Hamiltonian now has two parts to it. It has a string tension multiplying the number of faces. And has a dilaton multiplying the Euler character of the domain walls that contribute. Okay, so I can now tune both the string tension and the string coupling. And when you stick this into your into your partition sum, each configuration will be weighted by a factor of e to the phi times minus chi, where the minus chi comes from right here. So I have succeeded in defining for you a Hamiltonian that has both a tunable string tension and a tunable string coupling. And it's uh, complicated, but it's local, so we can study it with normal statistical mechanical techniques. And finally, you can think of this as a sort of non-perturbatively, sorry, non-perturbatively defined string theory on the lattice. Okay, are there any questions about this? Okay. So, um, so um, <clears throat> since you were talking about this strongly coupled theory, that's why uh, you yeah. have parameterize the string coupling with the dilaton? Exactly, exactly, that's right, yeah, exactly. The hope is that I can now adjust this dilaton to make the string coupling weak, and then I can solve things with a weak string coupling. That is the hope. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, all this stuff, next stuff is a little bit painful and complicated. The net point is just that you can do this, and you end up with a theory that cares about the Euler character of the domain walls. Okay, that's the, that's the net upshot of all of this. Okay, I'm, and, uh, finally, I'm yeah. a bit confused. I can understand. I have to check this thing again. So, why this particular four pi thing? Uh, this this branch uh, singularity, curvature singularity appearing. I couldn't be able to understand the logic. Could you please a, a little bit? It's it's a little bit complicated. To to be completely honest, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, idea is these all because you, you see when I figure out this number I have to make a choice about how the walls are connected. Here is the, the fundamental data, but I break it apart in this fashion into three different things, say. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying this wall is connected to this wall. This is connected to this. This is not connected to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's the possibility that this pattern of connections will be different on this side than on this side, because I make the choice at each vertex independently. Okay. If they are different, then this contributes a certain curvature singularity. That's the idea. Okay. okay. And the fact that it's four pi is honestly complicated. I encourage you to, to go through and print this thing out and play with this. This is genuinely how we figured it out, that it has to be a four pi singularity by making many, many paper models like this. Uh, but it turns out there's a mathematical way to do it as well. Um, you, know, so you can also do it with math. But the, we, we made many of these things to understand. It was very confusing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. OK, good. Um, any other questions? Yeah, this, is, this was helpful. OK, good. Any other questions um, before I move on? Thanks, by the way, for all these detailed questions. Okay. And again, the students, please feel free to, to interrupt. Uh, I would welcome more interruptions. OK, so when you say you study this with normal statistical mechanics techniques, are they only analytical or are they also numerical? They're both. We're going to do analytics and numerics in just two or three slides. Yeah. We'll do OK. Both. Yeah, great. Yeah. Analytics takes you only so far. So, um, yeah. Thank but, you. OK. So that seems like a, a, good, a, good, uh, a good segue into the next part. So um, here's, a, here's a Hamiltonian. Let's now try to understand the phase diagram of this Hamiltonian. OK. OK. So the Hamiltonian is this, where I have a number of faces and, a num and the Euler character, OK? Now, whenever these parameters, beta and phi, are large, we expect that the system will try to will enter an ordered phase, tries to minimize or maximize these numbers, f and chi, OK? 
So um, it, it, beta here is a lot like the string tension. In that case, if you take that seriously, like beta is like the inverse temperature or the string tension. If you take that seriously, you might want to keep beta positive. But you know, just in the interest of completeness, I'm going to let beta run over you know, positive and negative. And I'm going to let the dilaton phi also be positive and negative and try to understand what, what phases maximize, you know, so what phases maximize or minimize the area and the Euler character. And so this is easy to do. You just look at all the possible configurations of, of the spins. I assume the two by two by two unit cell, and you look for the ones that maximize or minimize either the area or the Euler character. It turns out you get four phases, which you can look at like this. Um, I'm going to describe the names of these phases. So first, let me point out what happens along the line, beta along the line phi equals to zero. If phi equals to zero, this term is not there. The string coupling is one. And we have the normal Ising model, okay? So at large beta, what the system wants to do is minimize this number f, which means it wants to minimize the number of domain walls that are present. The way in which you do that is to have all the spins pointing up or all the spins pointing down. And that describes the ferromagnetic phase, okay? That's the normal ferromagnetic phase of the Ising model. We discussed this earlier. Now, let's make beta very, very, very negative. In that case, the system wants to maximize f, OK? You maximize f by putting a, um, a domain at every possible place where you can, OK? And that's called the anti-ferromagnetic phase, because it turns out the spins now just anti, you know, alternate as you move around in space, OK? So this line is very well understood. It's the normal 3D Ising model. In the middle is some disordered phase. Now, um, let's now move up here, up and down. The thing I'm interested in is really large negative phi because that should be very weak string coupling. At weak string coupling, it turns out what the system wants to do is maximize the value of chi. And the way in which it does that is it fills space as many spheres as it can. Each sphere has Euler character two. If you can fit a lot of spheres in there, then it'll give you a large positive chi. And so space just fills it with many different spherical string, string world shapes. So I'm going to call that the packed phase. And it looks kind of like this. Each of these things has a topology of a sphere. But of course, the lattice is cubic, so it looks like a little cube. OK, so we have sphere, 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 sphere. Each of them contributes two. So that's the packed phase. And it turns out if you take five to very large positive numbers, then chi wants to be as negative as it can. You then to get some sort of complicated arrangement of tubes, which um, has the sort of thing has been studied before. They call it the plumber's nightmare because it's a bunch of tubes that intersect in a complicated pattern to give you a net negative Euler character per unit volume. Okay, and I will not show you a picture of it lest it haunt your dreams. But you can make pictures just like this of, of that phase as well. Okay, so this is pretty much as far as I can go. Um, just some analytics to understand exactly where the phase boundary is and what's happening over here. I should do some numerics. So let me do that uh, next. Um, any questions about the phase diagram before we move on? Or the expected phase diagram? OK. OK, good. So um, now here is numerics, OK? So um, if people are interested in numerics, I have a slide later that I can show you that has details of how the numerics work. But the basic idea is you use standard techniques and you simulate this Hamiltonian using Monte Carlo, OK? Information here because um, there's a complicated group theoretical structure of the order parameters. It turns out we constructed three different order parameters. There's one order parameter for ferromagnetic order, one order parameter for anti-ferromagnetic order, which is green. And finally, there's another order parameter, which I colored blue, okay, which measures the other two weird phases. And different phases have different colors, as you can see here. Okay? And um, black indicates that all the order parameters are zero. So you can see you get roughly the same picture as this, this mean field phase diagram. The phases are where I said they would be. The phase boundary lines don't quite line up. Like this one is working pretty well. This one isn't very good. But they're all roughly in the right place. OK. So what I'm really interested in, of course, is the phase transition, however. OK. Oh, sorry. Let me first explain what these phases mean from the point of view of string theory. In the ferromagnetic phase, the things, which are the domain walls between different phase, between up and down regions of, of spin have some finite tension. That's what you expect from sort of normal string theory. So you might expect this phase to be the normal string vacuum. However, as you approach this phase boundary, what happens is the strings start to wiggle around a lot more. And in the disordered phase, you can imagine they've condensed because it has gone crazy. You cannot easily separate up from down spins anymore. 
And so if you wanted to, this is the phase where strings have condensed, okay? And finally, as I mentioned earlier, the packed phase is filled with spherical string world sheets, okay? I don't have a good understanding of these two phases from string theory. Now, what I'm really interested in is this phase transition line. Now, this transition line, this point here was the normal 3D Ising transition. What I'm trying to do is force this transition to weak string coupling so I can study it using string theory. And you can see there's a line right here, which I've put in sort of a dashed blue, which should be that transition. And we can now ask what is happening as we move along this line. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about how you look for these transitions on the lattice. The idea is that you plot the particular combination of order parameters that I've shown here. This is called the Binder cumulant. And um, this is dimensionless, which means that if you plot this against the particular combination of the system size and the distance from the critical point, then you should get a universal curve, which is determined by the field theory describing the transition. This is not something we developed. This is a standard technique to find the exponent in critical phenomena from simulations. So we did that at different values of the string coupling. And here, this is the normal 3D Ising model. We find that the exponent is 0.6299. That is the known value for the Ising critical exponent. Um, I've studied this for many years. And what happens is as we alter the string coupling, as we make it smaller or stronger, this critical exponent does not change. And what that means is everywhere along this curve, the theory remains, this transition is in the normal 3D Ising class. Okay. That's what we have found from our numerics. So it's good because it means I can alter the string coupling and I don't lose the universality class that's of interest. Okay, any questions about this before so I go on? This G is some kind of kudosis type of thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's some, um, yeah, I forget. It's some sort of dimensionless kurtosis. Exactly. Yeah. I forget, I forget exactly how the kurtosis is defined, but it's something kind of like this, right? Um, so uh, yeah, good. Good. Um, yeah. The main point here is that just that it's dimensionless. And so um, you, if you get data collapsed from it, that means that you're at the critical point. Good. Other questions? Um, okay. Good. So um, that's fine. But notice that we had wanted to tune the Ising transition down to arbitrarily weak string coupling. This didn't actually work, okay? And um, the reason why is that there's this new phase that appears here, right? That new phase kind of messes everything up. And it turns out the smallest I can make the string coupling while still preserving um, this phase transition is GS equals to 0.661, okay? That's this value right here. And at that point, the bare string tension is zero, so I can't push it any further. And what's happening is, as I said, this new phase is getting in the way. And sadly, this is an obstruction to the basic idea, where the basic idea was um, to use the, um, this phase transition to uh, use this, um, this new parameter to understand this phase transition. I had been hoping the phase transition would go all the way down to zero coupling, but you can see instead it stops right here. And in retrospect, this is maybe obvious, but this is the obstacle to trying to use string theory to understand this. Okay. Okay. So, so um, that's about what I want to say about the lattice. After this, I'm going to switch gears and tell you about a different way to attack this problem. So, any questions? So, uh, having this uh, non zero uh, cumulant is uh, yeah. maybe it's not very important, but I'm just asking. So, it's, no, pointing, yeah. uh, it's pointing towards some kind of non Gaussian uh, theories when it is very strongly coupled. Oh, good, good, good. I think for um, so. I actually think that this is probably uh, non-zero, even for a Gaussian theory. Um, okay. This particular thing. Okay. Uh, let me think about this for a second. Um, yeah. So actually, the way this is, let's think about this. Oh, in a Gaussian theory, I believe O to the four would be exactly equal to O square square, right? Uh, yes. So um, I think then it's still non-zero. You then get three minus one times one, right? For the, the Gaussian theory. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that it is exactly, um, it's non-zeroness is important. You can use, I believe this same technology even for a Gaussian uh, thing, but this is built so that it interpolates between zero and one 
where it is zero at, in the high temperature phase and one in the, in the ordered phase. Okay. That's the construction of this of this guy. Okay. And so you can see it's always doing that in these pictures, right? It always starts at one and goes to zero. It's okay, it's off this side here, but it starts at one and goes to zero. So more, the important thing is that it doesn't depend on the dimensions. And so you hope that at the critical point, the, um, the lattice spacing doesn't appear in this expression anymore. You get a universal formula for this. That's the, where this universal curve here is fixed by the continuum theory. That's, that's the idea. One more question that uh, we know what, once you approach towards the critical point, you will get a huge fluctuations. Yeah. So mostly yeah. when you do the numerics, you have yeah. to approach from bo both the sides. And you have to minimize the error uh, like around the critical point. So yeah. a particular yeah. Yeah. algorithm or something like that you have used to- do Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So good. So um, I have a slide at the end about this, but you're absolutely correct. Um, just to explain to everyone, you see um, simulating becomes very difficult at the critical point itself because there are basically long wavelength fluctuations that you have to equilibrate. And so there's different sorts of algorithms one uses. And um, uh, actually, so shall I go look at this? <laughs> so this is the slide on numerics, OK? So we use two different um, methods. We use single spin updates, the normal metropolis algorithm, which is sort of the first thing you learn when doing this. And we also use the kind of cluster algorithm. What the cluster algorithms do is they flip lots of spins at once, OK? like large chunks of the thing at once, we had to adjust the usual cluster algorithm for our new Hamiltonians. We had to build a new cluster algorithm. And this cluster algorithm is good near the critical point. And this was all quite fun, to be honest. This was my first uh, numerical project uh, like with Monte Carlo, but it was, I found it quite, quite interesting and, and, and fun to get into. But we did have to work kind of hard. In particular, this we had to build it to exactly deal with the problem you're talking about, these large fluctuations. If you don't use one of the cluster algorithms, then the equilibration takes a really long time at the phase transition point. No, and so, I have asked the, because my I did this kind of simulations when uh, the, actually my master's thesis on uh, this critical phenomenon on Isaac model. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right, exactly. Yeah. So um, the skills that you develop there, I think, are extremely useful. I developed them very late in my life, only over the last year. But uh, you you are ideally suited to uh, to study this further. Yeah. But it's, it's a very good question, yeah. Good. Um, other questions? Um, anything at all? OK. So um, excellent. So basically, the main point of this, if you don't like the numerics, uh, then the main point of this is just that you can curves. Okay? And these curves are, as far as I can tell, uh, reliable. We, we spent a lot of tedious time looking at the errors and stuff like that. OK. But the upshot is, I tried to solve this using string theory by tuning the string coupling to very small values. This didn't quite work because the minimum string coupling that I got was 0.6, okay, which is not zero. And in fact, there are other problems as well. So I, I did lots of very serious stuff on the lattice. I step back and think, you know, say, say you try to get a world shape theory, what would the world shape theory even look like? It's quite confusing, you know? Because you see, at the critical point, the world shape theory should realize 3D conformal invariance. Oh, now that we are all sophisticated, we know about holography. That means that probably the critical point, one way to realize this is to have an ADS4 target space. But if you try to build a sigma model on this target space, that sigma model is not actually conformally invariant. Okay, And that's a big problem. There's some evidence for a non-trivial conformally invariant fixed point uh, of the sigma model. Um, but I think it's not conclusive. And I don't really know how to stabilize a sigma model on this target space. Okay, But I would need something like that to get the right symmetries of the 3D in critical point. And imagine that I managed to fix that, imagine that I managed to solve that problem. Even then, it's very hard to cancel the violin anomaly because you have to do something, it's not gonna have the right critical number of dimensions for sure. So you have to cancel the violin anomaly in some way. You might wanna try to use this linear dilaton to cancel the violin anomaly, but that would break target space scale invariance. So the upshot is I actually cannot think of a simple way to write down a world sheet theory that describes the 3D Isaac model. Okay, and this is a very hard problem uh, that many people have tried in the past. I showed you this list of literature. I think we have made some progress on it, but, but not really that much. So in the next part of this talk, I'm gonna discuss a different way to attack a similar problem, okay? But maybe before moving on to the last part of the talk, which is I'm gonna call mean string field theory, I'll ask, are there any other questions about this, this stuff before I move on? 
So uh, could you please explain again that why you are uh, in, uh, like considering this shift symmetry in phi? Um, very good. So basically, I if I'm looking for a world sheet description of this phase transition, I might expect the transition to have um, a 3D conformal invariance. And one way to do that is to have an ADS4 target space, like this one, right? Mm -hmm. But this one, phi translations of this, of this thing are scale invariants, right? Yes. And so I want to have this symmetry in my action, because then I will have the scale invariance that I need for the critical point. OK. okay. However, this is not compatible with this standard approach to, you know, to soak up the violet anomaly. We often multiply phi r you know, to do non-critical string theory. That doesn't work, because this breaks this symmetry. So basically, this is just a, a set of ideas that I think does not have a simple resolution. Uh, so the you have work. written you have written the action in world sheet to the world sheet. Yeah, in two D world sheet. That's right. Yeah. Oh, two D world sheet. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, so for those of you who are confused by this, it, it's okay. Um, this doesn't really work anyway, so it's perfectly fine to be to be confused by it. Uh, but if anyone has any thoughts, I would really appreciate it if you could let me know. Okay. So, um, so that's the, the world sheet theory, but now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Okay. So everything I told you up till now has, has, um, is in this earlier paper. I'm now going to switch to discussing work that is not out yet. It's work that's very much in progress, but I wanted to discuss it um, anyway, because I think it's quite interesting because it's still in progress. It's quite possible that there are things that are wrong with it. Um, so with that disclaimer, let me just continue and, and tell all of you what this, this idea is. So it's fair to say that though we, we built an interesting statistical physics model, we ultimately could not solve the 3D icing transition using string theory. And the reason is the fixed point could not be pushed to weak string coupling. I'm always stuck at strong string coupling. So what that really means is it suggests we need a non-perturbative formulation of string theory. This is the kind of idea that string field theory is supposed to solve. Now, if you're like me, the idea, the words string field theory are, uh, are very scary because this is a notoriously hard problem to have a non perturbative formulation of string theory. However, we do have a new tool and the hope is that these higher form symmetries that I discussed might be helpful in attacking this problem, okay? In this table here, I've drawn something which my collaborator, John McGreevy calls the method of the missing box. And what that means is if you want to understand normal symmetry breaking, you use mean field theory what is it that you use to understand higher form symmetry breaking? What is it that plays the same role as mean field theory for higher form symmetries? If we could understand that, it might be something that is along these lines. So for the next four or five slides, I'm going to try to build that object. Okay, so let me begin by reviewing for everyone what normal mean field theory is, okay? And I'm gonna do this for a U1 symmetry. Okay. The Ising model is a U2 symmetry. Yeah, sorry. So here string field theory means you want to write some theory in like in terms of some uh, Riemann surfaces and uh, some punctures on that and like that, those kind of things. It's going to, it turns out it's going to be different and not involve Riemann surfaces, what I'm gonna build. Um, oh. Because this is the reason why, let me, re can I revisit your question at the very end? It turns out it's not going to involve Riemann surfaces, okay? But it will involve uh, other things um, that I'll, I'll tell you about. Oh, I'm, and, uh, again, this is, yeah, I'm this is in with the stuffs which Ashok Shen did. Oh, very, very good. It it will turn out to not be connected to that, um, and I'll explain why. Well, uh, but Ashok Shen did is much more sophisticated than what I'm going to discuss because yeah. that's solving a harder problem than, than I am. But I'll I'll mention uh, the difference in, in a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This, the, the, turns out the word, the, there's a word here, um, which is mean. This mean word is important to in this thing, okay? It's not going to be normal string field theory. It'll be mean string field theory. And I'll explain what that means, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, but yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, okay. So let me just remind everyone how normal mean field theory works, okay? For normal, uh, let's think about the breaking of a U1 global symmetry, okay? So again, I, I, sh I showed a slide like this at the beginning. Let me just remind everyone in the U1 case, the idea is if I want to describe the break of a, what I often do is I write down a continuum theory that looks like this, okay? Where here phi is a field which describes maps from space-time points to complex numbers, okay? Phi of x is a complex field, which means that every point in space-time, it takes on a complex valued number. 
And the U1 global symmetry acts on phi by rotating it by a phase. That's phase is e to the i alpha. And then I write down the most general action that I can, okay, subject to this symmetry principle. And you know, there's some terms that appear here, m square phi square lambda phi to the fourth. Again, I can't have phi cubed because there's no way to make phi cubed U1 invariant. And then this potential now has, a, has two phases. If the mass is positive, then I have a single minimum. If the mass is negative, then I have two minima like this. And again, if m squared is positive, then phi rolls to the bottom and it's at zero. And this is the spontaneous, this is the unbroken phase, sorry. And if m is negative, then phi rolls down to the bottom here and now takes a non-zero value because the origin is here. And you find that phi, the VEV of phi is non-zero and this is the ordered phase. This idea describing phase transitions using a, a simple field theory is basically the idea behind mean field theory. And this action can be quantitatively used to describe the phase transition if this dimension D is high enough, greater than or equal to four. Okay, it turns out you can describe the phase transition with this action. The critical point between these two phases is when M squared equals to zero, okay? Then you have a phase transition, you have a scale invariant field theory, and the properties of the transition, for example, the correlation length will diverge at this point. You'll have a singularity in the thermodynamics and so on and so forth. You understand all of those from this field theory. Okay. And again, this works really well if the space-time dimension is high enough. If the dimension is low, then it might become more complicated, but the idea is, I think, still useful. Okay. Okay. Are what there any questions about normal mean field theory? Yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, if I uh, compare this slide with your previous slides, so yeah. previously you also mentioned about the same theory, but yeah. I'm just looking here, the sign of M square and Lambda is negative, which is previously you have written positive. So is there- Oh, <laughs> sorry. sorry, that's a mistake. That's a mistake, that should, this should be positive, yeah. I, it appears that I accidentally switched from a uh, Euclidean signature in the previous part to Lorentzian signature here. I'm sorry, oh, okay. These are, it should be positive. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I should say that uh, most of the formulas are only schematic and meant to illustrate the idea. Yeah, the formulas in the paper are correct. The formulas here are just, just, the, just the ideas. Yeah, so apologies for that. These should definitely be positive. Yeah. Good, thank you. This is, this is a Euclidean action. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so um, yeah. So the main point is that, that this mean field theory describes this phase transition for a normal global symmetry. Okay, so now I have to write something like this for higher form symmetries. Okay, how do I do it? Sorry, I'm not done yet. Um, I also, this mean field theory provides a low energy description of the condensed phase. Okay, so what does that mean? Again, let's take M squared to be negative so that this potential has a minimum, okay? In that case, the vacuum manifold, what you can do is you can write phi as V e to the i theta. And theta is the phase mode, which tells you how to move around the bottom of this potential. It turns out that because theta has overlap with the symmetry, at low energies, this action can be reduced to the following gapless Goldstone mode action. Okay, so plug this ansatz into there. What you find is that V, if you set it equal to the minimum of the potential, develops a map but theta doesn't. And so at low energies, you get the following gapless Goldstone mode action. Okay. But now this is not a global symmetry. This is a local symmetry, right? Um, the theory still has a global symmetry, Okay. but um, this field theta is a gapless Goldstone mode from spontaneously breaking that global symmetry. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. The theory is global symmetry, but indeed theta, you know, theta's fluctuations look like local symmetry fluctuations. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the point is that at low energies, you again get this gapless Goldstone mode action. So now the question is, can we construct something like this for higher form symmetries? And um, this is confusing because charged operators are defined on curves and not on points, okay? But let's try to develop the same formalism for higher form symmetries, okay? So, um, all right, so how do we do this? So we're gonna try, this is gonna be very bold, okay? And we're gonna construct everything by analogy, okay? And we'll just see how far we get with this. So for an ordinary symmetry, I have this action. And remember, I have my mean field order parameter 5x. 
phi of x is a map from points to the complex numbers, c. And the symmetry acts like this. Phi of x is multiplied by a phase that is constant, which means that d alpha is 0. OK? What are the analogs of these guys for a higher form symmetry? So a higher form symmetry, if you remember from earlier on in this talk, the order parameter is not defined on points, but on curves, OK? So the object that transforms in the right way is no longer defined on points. It has to be defined on curves. So my function phi of x has to become a functional, which is a map from the space of curves c, the space of curves to the complex numbers c. Okay. This bold c is different from this italic c. This italic c is a curve, and psi is a map from the space of curves to the complex numbers. Okay. This function null is going to be my basic degree of freedom in what follows. What is the symmetry transformation? Previously, phi is multiplied by a phase e to the i alpha. In this new thing, psi of c is going to be multiplied by a phase, but that phase is now an integral of a1 form along this curve c. Okay. Previously, I had d alpha equal to 0. Now I'm going to have d gamma equal to 0, where this means that gamma is a closed one form. And this is the action of the higher form symmetry on my functional psi. So you can see what's going on here. I'm just going to take everything and just write a, you know, write its analogous object. Okay. Okay. So let's keep going. For ordinary street, we take derivatives of my field phi. The ordinary derivative, um, what does it do? Well, you take your field phi, you move a little bit in some direction, delta x mu, that the field phi changes. And so you get a derivative which measures how much the field changes as you move. That's obviously what a field, what a derivative does. For the higher form symmetry, my field psi is not defined on points anymore, but on curves. So I need to find some way to compare two nearby curves. Okay. It turns out this has already been constructed in the 80s and 90s by giants in the field like Polyakov and Migdal. They constructed an object called the area derivative. And this is really a beautiful geometric construction which tells you the following thing. If you have your field psi defined on a curve, what you do is you add a new little bit of curve at this little point here. And that little bit of curve defines an area element, delta sigma, which sort of fills in this thing here. And you can then differentiate your field psi with respect to that area element. In other words, this answers the question, how does the field psi change if you add a little bit of area to your curve? And uh, this object was constructed by, by these people. It's a little bit formal, but um, the more I work with it, the more I realize how, uh, how beautiful this is, this, this construction. This lambda is kind of an affine parameter on the curve? Precisely. Lambda is a parameter along the curve. Okay, So lambda moves you along this curve right here. And uh, it's good to take it to be affine, yeah. In actual calculations, I take it to be defined, an affine parameter, that's right. OK. OK. Now, in normal symmetries, we integrate over all points. OK. For higher form symmetries, because my field is defined on curves, I'm going to have to perform a functional integral over the space of all curves. OK? So you can see all I'm doing is I'm taking each thing and, um, and promoting it, giving it one more dimension. OK, so now that we have all of this, we can now construct the action of mean string field theory, which plays the same role as mean field theory, except for higher form symmetries. So the action is integral over all curves times the following combination of area derivatives, okay? Plus every term that you can write down, which is invariant under the symmetries. So you can see I get a term like psi dagger psi, psi dagger psi to the, you know, to the power of four and so on and so forth. The reason why I get all these terms is because again, I have phase symmetry, which means that psi must always appear together with this complex conjugate. And it's a non-trivial fact that you can check that this particular thing is actually invariant under the symmetry. Okay, that involves the structure of the area derivative. And so the idea is that this object might describe the spontaneous breaking of higher form symmetries, just as normal mean field theory describes the breaking of normal symmetries. This is what I call mean string field theory. Okay. 
So notice there are many more degrees of freedom in this problem because the basic degree of freedom psi of c is now a functional and not a function. And in fact, even evaluating the action requires a functional integral over the space of closed curves, which is a well-defined thing, but it's still a bit more complicated. So now here's a, a difficult but well-posed problem. This is a theory I just made and wrote down to observe my symmetries. What does this theory describe? So I want to stress that though this is, this is difficult, it's much easier than, in my opinion, than, than real string field theory. Charenton asked about the theory that uh, Oshok Sen and other, other people have worked with. Real string field theory is a theory that reproduces in some limit the perturbation theory amplitudes of real fundamental theory. This theory is definitely not UV complete. I'm only trying to use it to describe phase transitions and other things involving higher form symmetries, okay? So for that reason, this is easier, I think, than, than real string field theory. It's still a little bit complicated, but it's something that we can study. Okay, any questions about the philosophy before I then say a few more words about what comes out of this theory? No, I can understand. Hello, may I ask a question? Yeah, please ask, please ask. Hello, it is, is, is technique a uh, linear expand of uh, uh, of the motion of the action linear expand um can I, you're saying can i linearly expand this action is that is that the question uh. oh uh, i'm sorry uh, i think do you do a connection problem i couldn't quite I, hear the, the question could you repeat it uh, Can you repeat uh, the question, please? Yeah, super sorry. Um, I wonder if there's a connection problem. Yes. So I, I have the question that uh, it seems that I can understand like the construction, just I want to understand like um, here, the first term is kind of playing the kinetic term type of thing. So yep. here, um, like in terms of the theory, I can understand like uh, once you go for the numerics, how you, how you will handle this kind of stuff, this integration of our affine parameter and all. Yeah, um, it's very hard actually. Um, so I don't think this is good for spherically. This is an analytic attack at the problem, not a numerical one. I don't think this is very good for numerics actually because there are too many degrees of freedom. So yes. on the next two or three slides, I'll discuss my analytic attack on this problem. Yeah. Okay. I think numerics is very difficult. Yeah. So it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so let me proceed. Um, please interrupt if there, there are more questions. Um, so let me now, in the next uh, two or three slides, I'm going to discuss um, uh, what, what this theory tries to describe. Okay. Now, um, I should say, by the way, this is actually hard to work with. So I wouldn't say that we understand this theory completely. Uh, I'm just going to tell you current attempt at, at understanding this theory. So the first thing you should ask is, what are the phases of this theory? Okay. So again, let's first start by taking, the, you see, this is like a potential for this field psi, which I'm going to call the string field. And um, this potential is positive. Uh, or, sorry, excuse me, let me say that again. If I take m squared to be positive, then this potential has only a single minimum. And you might think, by analogy with normal mean field theory, that this has a uh, describes the unbroken phase. Okay, so um, I cannot really solve these string field equations of motion because they're too hard. However, in the limit where m square is very, very, very large, in that limit I can solve them. All right, and um, if you solve them, you can find that there is an area law solution to the quadratic part of the action where I ignore the nonlinearities. Okay. There's a solution which looks like this. The string field of psi goes like the exponential of minus m times the area, the minimal area that fills in the curve c. Okay. So you can show this is the solution to these string field equations. And I'm happy to discuss how I derive this, but um, it's a bit non-trivial, but I can discuss it afterwards if people are interested. This is the expected action in the unbroken phase. You earlier, this is what you want to happen in the unbroken phase. 
The reason why the area appears here is because it turns out this area derivative behaves with this area, minimal area expression. That's why the area appears in the exponent here. Okay. And this is kind of interesting because you see, this is sort of describing confinement uh, in a sense, but this theory has no gauge symmetry in it. It's a purely global description of confinement. And um, this, this makes sense. Um, and it would be very interesting to explore this further. In particular, Migdal and Makenko and others tried to reformulate QCD in a loop formulation many years ago. I believe that there's a connection between our equations and theirs, though I've not been able to understand this in detail. Uh, Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, I, I just want to ask that when you say that n square is sufficiently large, so uh, yeah, you are not talking about free theory, but you are taking lambda to be kind of perturbation here. Is it? Yeah, like that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I, this exact expression, this formula, I can only do in the free theory, actually. Yes. Um, yeah. But um, in principle, you could formulate perturbation theory with, with lambda around this. But uh, we've not done that yet. Yeah. Yes. yes. That's right. In principle, you could. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, the truth is, it's life is hard because this this integral is complicated. This integral dc. Yeah, yeah, that's that's for that reason. Yeah, exactly. But in, in principle, I think with some more work, you should be able to solve it for all m and not just large m. In principle. Okay. 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 Good. But this behavior, I should I should say, is expected. Okay. So that's good. The unbroken phase is working. So now um, let's talk about the broken phase. In the broken phase, um, the potential might look like this. I take m squared negative, and the potential now has a minimum. And now, what you want to do now is um, you want to understand the fix here. Now, the nonlinearity is important, okay? Because the nonlinearity stabilizes this potential. And so, this is complicated. What you can try to do is try to isolate the low energy degrees of freedom. So, just like I did for the the other zero, the other conventional symmetry case, I'm going to write this, this functional psi of c as v times, times e to the i integral of, of a over this curve c. Okay. This is a particular ansatz for the form of psi, where a is a particular low-lying degree of freedom okay, that I hope is useful. And then what you can do is you can do this integral over curves explicitly, and you can find that there is a low energy action for this field a, which is dA squared times some constants that I've worked out. Okay. So in particular, what does this mean? This means that A looks a lot like a gauge boson. Okay. In fact, on general grounds, you expect in this broken phase, there should be a gapless Goldstone mode. Okay. We have proven a theorem earlier that says that you have to get a Goldstone mode in this case. And in this case, you can actually derive its action from the low-lying degrees of freedom of this theory. And um, again, I can give more details if people are interested, but you can derive this action in, uh, in this manner. What we have not done completely is, what I expect to happen is that all other degrees of freedom should be gapped. The only gapless degree of freedom should be A. I wouldn't say I have been able to solve that um, completely yet, but we're working on it. Um, in particular, there is no evidence though at the moment for any other gapless modes. Normal string theory has gravity in it. I see no evidence for any gravity here, okay? This mode is gapless because it's protected by a symmetry. The gravity mode, I don't see any evidence for gravity in this theory, basically. So this is normal string theory, this is something different. Right. Okay. So um, this was just a, a bit of a teaser about the string field theory, but there's still a lot more to be done. We only indicated the state of this, and there's a lot more that one can do. For example, you could try to construct the propagator, you can try to understand perturbation theory. Um, there's some sort of interesting RG that should happen in loop space that you can try to understand. And um, really the thing that I'm most interested in is whether we can use this to describe interesting phase transitions. The, the fantasy that I have is that I'm going to, I would like to unite the two halves of this talk and, for example, describe the 3D Ising exponents from this string field theory framework. That's a fantasy that I have. There are many reasons why this is probably impossible. In particular, it's very difficult to deal with. In this, in this framework, and I don't really see any way to organize that in a useful way. I think a more realistic thing that we can do is to understand the growth structure of the phase diagram. And you know, mean field theory is useful above the upper critical dimension. Typically, there's an upper critical dimension, and mean field theory becomes exact if your dimension is higher than that. For normal symmetries, that upper critical dimension is four. For this string field theory, there's reason to believe the upper critical dimension is eight, although I'm not sure about this yet. 
And um, I think there's reason to believe that this theory should correctly describe those phase transitions in dimension higher than eight. And again, if you're interested to ask me about it, I can tell you why I think that's the case, though I have not felt uh, strongly enough about it to put it on the slide. And um, we'll see how much one can do with this. I think there's much to explore here. And even if it does not succeed in deriving the Ising exponents, I'm hopeful that we're going to learn a lot about phase transitions, higher form symmetry, and string theory um, along the way. OK, so um, I'm almost done. Let me just wrap up. So future directions are basically, the, the biggest question for me is, suppose we use higher form symmetries and anomalies and all these things. What is the new Landau paradigm that we get? Does it include all the phases of matter, including topological phases? And furthermore, can string theory, either perturbative string theory or this putative new mean string field theory form, help us understand critical phenomena in statistical physics? Or more excitingly, can statistical physics and critical phenomena help us define string theory in a new unperturbative way? Okay, thank you uh, for listening. Uh, that's all that I've got. So let me just conclude with a picture. Thank you, Nabil, for your excellent talk. And I'm very happy that you have explained quite uh, well. And uh, thank you. <laughs> at the end, I can able to say that I have uh, like learned a lot. <laughs> and since okay, uh, I can able to connect with my previous work that I did, I feel very good that, yeah, at least I have understood something. <laughs> yeah. So if uh, guys, you, if you have any question, please ask him. So this is now a little bit of discussion session. Any question, any comment, please do. And uh, don't write anything in the chat box because he can actually uh, directly uh, answer your questions. Before doing that, just I, I want to ask Nabil, to look into the uh, camera because I have, have to take your one picture for uh, our archive. Yes, thank you. So now please uh, uh, ask the question, um, whoever available. Any question or comments from the, I don't know. Kiran? Yeah, hi again. Um, to go back to the numerical analysis you discussed about, so like 20 minutes ago, you said the main issue was to finding the states, right? Is that correct? Uh, the main issue, meaning um, th there were. Um, I'm not sure what I would say the main issue is, but I think this is a, a well-posed problem that you can attack numerically. Um, sorry, which which slide? Were you talking about a particular slide or? Um... Uh, I don't remember precise yeah. slides, but I think it was for G being too small. Oh, yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, so the main, okay, sorry. I think I understand what you mean by point, by issue rather, yeah. So here's the, the phase diagram of my model. And, um, you know, the, the point is, I was sort of hoping that this phase transition would persist to weak string coupling. I didn't really have a very good reason to, 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 to believe that would happen, but I was, I was hoping for it. It turns out the phase transition stops at, at finite string coupling, where the string coupling is about 0.6. You know? mm -hmm. So that, that is, um, I would say, not, not ideal from a point of view of solving the 3D Ising model, but it's very physically sensible. Uh, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. OK, and uh, you said something about um, the simulations converging or something like oh, this. Uh, sorry, no, I think that they do converge. Um, what you want us to do is you have to work hard. Well, I don't know about hard, but um, you have to work, or I had to learn new things. Uh, you have to use um, one of these cluster algorithms to, to get efficient simulations at the critical point. Um, but this is, I think, standard in the field, not uh, anything new to us. So, um, mm. but we had to, I guess, we had to work a little bit to up to um, write a cluster algorithm for our model. Uh, because I think the implementation of this cluster algorithm depends on the Hamiltonian. So we had to do that for our model. But once we did that, it was, it was okay. It didn't, the plots that I showed you, I mean, they, they, um, they didn't take infinitely long to make. We, we didn't have to use a fancy cluster. John used his, um, John Mager used his, his computer. It took a few days, not like months or anything like that. So, so I, think it, I think it's okay, yeah. Okay, but what takes time is to generate, for example, these Ansible of spins not to compute, for example, the different terms in uh, your 
I'm no, no, right. no, no, that, that, that doesn't take that. That's not that. Um, that's not that bad. I mean, a little bit. Let me think about this carefully. Um, I think that's correct. You know, what, what takes time is just generating statistics. Yeah. Mm. Of course, I mean, the more complicated the Hamiltonian, I guess, the, the longer it takes to evaluate each each step, right, and check whether you want to accept the step or not. But I don't think that's that's the big thing. Yeah. And I think another thing is this: basically, nothing here is very shocking. Makes us more confident in the numerics. If you're trying to derive a new critical exponent, you know, then to work harder. But because we expect the transition to remain in the Ising class, because of that, the fact that we see reasonable data collapse for that value of the exponent makes us confident that that it's okay. I think if you want to really derive a new exponent, you have to work much harder and much more time on it. So. Okay. Thank you very much. So, like, uh, I have a few questions, like. Uh, through this analysis, how you can able to understand the or, uh, order of the phase transition? Uh, yeah, yeah. In the numerics, you mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, I, I didn't show you the specific heat. You can look at things like specific heat and so on. Um, but what I will say is that in, in these plots, you see, um, uh, that, that time uh, bit yeah, let me show you this one. This is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So let me, let me try to explain this plot. So, um, so here are different system sizes, six, eight, and 10, right? But notice that if I plot the answer as a function of this particular combination of parameters, then the, the, all the curves line up on one curve, even though the system size is different. Okay. I can't able to see. What that means is the physics oh. depends only on the combination. No, I can't see the plots that you were pointing. Sorry? So probably you haven't shared the screen. Oh, you can't see the plot? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I don't know what happened. Yeah, sorry. It says I'm still sharing it. Hang on. Wait, that's weird. How long have I not been showing the thing? Hang well, on. I was seeing uh, the plot. So. Oh, you were. Okay. Can people see the plot now? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, okay. okay. Good. Okay. Start started again. Okay. Sorry, right? I wasn't just talking this whole time. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Uh, so, okay. So here's the, um, here's the plot. So notice that there are three different system sizes, six, eight, and 10. Okay. So the, the non-trivial point here is that if you plot this dimensionless object, the binder cumulant against this particular combination of variables, okay, phi minus phi C times L to the power of one over new, all the different curves line up on one curve. And that's non-trivial. Okay, that's, that doesn't happen generically. What that means is the physics depends only on this combination. Okay, and so from that you can actually conclude there's a, there's a, a variant point where, in a sense, the lattice spacing has dropped out from this calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means it's a continuous phase transition, and I think that's the simplest way to see that. Okay, had it been for example first order phase transition, you would not have gotten the collapse here. Mm. Okay, and furthermore, the goodness of this depends on the value of this exponent nu. We knew that the exponent should be in the rising class. We tried it with that, okay? And we got extended data collapse. If you didn't know that, then what you would do is you would minimize, you'd vary this exponent and try to minimize this, this good of this fit. You know, from that, you can try to estimate the exponent. But we just tried it directly with the Ising exponent and found it to work out. How you find out this combination, like phi minus phi C L to the power one minus new? Very good. What you assume is there is a single relevant operator deriving this, driving the system through the transition. Okay. At the critical point, that's that's a correct thing to assume. And you furthermore know what the dimension of the relevant operator is. The dimension of the relevant operator is like new or something like that. And therefore, this is the dimensionless combination of phi minus phi c, which couples to the relevant operator, and L system size. Yeah, we use so this is this is all standard stuff in the yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No. That's yeah. So it's. I think this is like fun stuff that you probably did in your in your masters, but I, I had not actually done this until uh, until last year for the first time. But it's. Uh, I suppose better late than never. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments um, or question? I think not. Kiran, do you have any question? Or uh, no, sir. It's clear. So if not, please uh, unmute yourself and give a clap for 
Nabil for giving such a interesting talk. And uh, this talk will be posted in YouTube. Once the link will be generated, I will share the link with everyone and Nabil also. And uh, I'm hopeful that though, those who haven't attended after seeing this talk, once it is posted, they will be happy to gain a lot of knowledge from this. And I would urge them, if you have any specific question, please write to Nabil directly in his email ID. Uh, and you can discuss if you want. So that's the thing. And uh, uh, if you want to say, Nabil, any, anything, just you can comment at the end. Um, Um, I don't have much to say, but thanks again. This is, this is great fun. Um, and uh, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Uh, I'm just...